Story number one. A dream come true. Koidel woke up like another day of quarantine, months ago without seeing his friends. Months ago without going to a convention. But only a few hours after he last wore his fursuit. He had taken some photos and uploaded them on Twitter. From his bed in the morning, without getting up yet, he picked up his phone to check how was the activity of his last tweets, how many retweets and how many likes he had received. He was excited about the reaction from people of his fursuit pictures. What had people said about them? But when he picked up his phone, he realized something. He had paused. Hadn't he taken his forfeit off the night before? Because his hands were animal paws. Then he checked under the covers. And indeed, he still had the body and fur of his coyote. Am I stupid, he thought. How did I forget to take off my fursuit? And how didn't I die of heat overnight? But when he wanted to take off his glove, because he wanted to grab his phone, he realized that it wasn't a glove. He looked up a little and he saw that his fursuit was hanging just where he had left it last night. Then he jumped up, realizing that no, he hadn't left his fursuit on. Actually, he had become his persona. He ran to his bathroom mirror, almost stumbling, realizing that his feet were now animal paws. Looking in the mirror, he did not see his human face. He saw the face of his persona. But it wasn't the face of a fursuit, oh no. He could gesture. He could open his muscle. He could blink, move his ears. Finally, Cody had become his persona for real. What a dream come true. He wanted to go out running with excitement. But he barely got out and he could see one of his neighbors looking out at the balcony. And before his neighbor could look at him, he returned home slamming the door shut. He thought that he really couldn't go out like this. People were going to be frightened. And when people get scared, they don't handle unknown situations in a very sensible way. But at least his furry friends had to know that. It was an incredible thing that had happened to him, a dream come true. So the first thing that he thought was to surprise everyone in a live stream. So he went to his computer, opened YouTube, and without announcing anything, he started a live on the same channel where we made Viernes Furry. Even without announcing anything, the people who follow the channel started receiving notifications. And little by little, people began to appear on the live. So on the microphone, he told them that he had something important to announce. A surprise of which surely they wouldn't be prepared. That definitely would surprise them. So he turned on the webcam, very excited. His heart was pounding. People could see Koidel's camera, but everyone was surprised. They didn't understand what Koidel wanted to show them. They could see only his bedroom, empty. Even they could see his seat, but no one was sitting there. Obviously, Coidel also realized that. Why wasn't he showing on the webcam? It was like he were invisible. He made sure looking at his hands, his body, over and over again. Everything was there. He was still his persona. He was sure he hadn't disappeared. He could clearly feel the fur and he could know the feeling of having paw pads on his hands. He looked at the camera again, looking closer, but he did not seem to appear in the video. 
Without saying anything else, he stopped the live show. He took his cell phone, he activated the camera in selfie mode, and nothing. He couldn't see anything. He took some photos and then checked the files and nothing. He thought, this surely is a dream. I'm going to wake up. He noticed on his phone a notification from Paco asking him. Hey, Goidel, what was that stream you did about? I didn't quite understand what the surprise you were talking about so much. Then, nervously, Goidel tried to write on his phone. But he realized that it was very difficult to write on a touch screen with his canine paws. So he threw out his phone and he ran to the computer to answer Paco, because it was much easier for him to type on the keyboard of a desktop computer so he could tell him everything that was going on. You won't believe me, I'm my persona, I can see myself in the mirror and I'm Coidal, I'm not Andres, I'm Coidal the Coyote, I'm not kidding you, you have to come visit me to believe me. Paco, a little incredulous, but wanting to trust his friend, asked him to send him a picture. That is another big problem, Koidel said. It seems that I'm invisible to the cameras. Like if you were a vampire? Paco asked. Yeah, but not entirely because I can see myself in the mirror. Come visit me and I'll show you. Paco, a little worried, said, Haven't you seen the news today? The coronavirus mutated. It is now a toxic air. Now we are in a mandatory and strict lockdown, not only in the state but throughout the country. Maybe this is happening in several countries. No one can get out of our houses. Then Koidel took the remote of his TV and pressing button with his clumsy paw, he managed to turn it on. And he saw that what Paco said was true, no one could leave their houses. Whoever went out, even by car, would be arrested. Therefore, he couldn't go visit his friends, nor asking his friends to visit him. He wanted to tweet about it, but without photographic evidence, no one would believe him. He was eager for hours because he didn't know how to prove that he had really become his persona. Over and over again, he tried to make videos of himself, take pictures of himself. He even went to his attic and dust off an old video camera. He grabbed an old movie and recorded over it, but no, it still didn't work. In general, not a single camera seemed to work. He resigned himself to staying like this. He had no choice but to continue working on his drawings. It was also hard because the new shape of his paws instead of hands made that job difficult to do. He went to sleep that night while thinking, maybe this was just a dream, it never happened. It was just my imagination, tomorrow I'll wake up and tell everyone what I dream of, because this is a pretty interesting dream. But the next morning, when he woke up, the first thing he did was looking at his hands and apparently, it was not a dream, he was still a coyote. He had no other choice, because he kept trying to record himself, he took pictures again, he kept everything exactly the same as the day before. Then he had to continue his date as any other day. He also had to resign himself to cooking on his own what was already in the kitchen. For the extreme mandatory quarantine, not even delivery could go out. So he couldn't even prove that to the delivery guys he was a coyote. Next four days were the same. Each day was identical. And Cody couldn't wait when the mandatory quarantine was going to end. So he could finally be seen by somebody else in his coyote form. But the, but the fifth day happened. That morning, everything was different. Everything changed. He was still asleep when suddenly the doorbell of his house woke him up. Meek! He jumped up to open the door. 
running while yelling, I'm coming! Many things came to his mind while he was walking to open. What's going to be the reaction of whoever is stringing, seeing me like this? Will somebody finally believe me? And while he was running, he realized that he could already do it normally. He even felt very strange how he was walking. When he looked down to see his feet, he stopped dead in his tracks. He looked at his hands. Were human hands again? He had returned to normal. That caused him a stir of emotions. What had all that been? Now the excitement to knowing who was ringing and how their reaction was going to be was over. Indeed, he was excited to the idea that somebody was finally going to see him like that. The doorbell rang again. Meek. All right, I had to go open. He opened the door. It was Paco. Hey, hi, Coidel. They just removed the mandatory extreme quarantine and I immediately wanted to come. Oh. I thought the Fortuna thing was true. I was believing you. It was a fact that Coidel kept this experience to himself all his life. Never became his persona again. And he never had how to prove it. Bubbles the Fox This was the pursuit of a red fox. Big, pretty green eyes. He was a red fox, but the color of his fur was orange. A very beautiful orange. The fursuit had a very big friendly smile. It was very easy to trust that cute face. Even those people who didn't belong to the furry fandom, they were very happy just to see him. He was always painting smiles anywhere. Anyone had the desire to go and hug him each time they saw him. Also, it was very admirable to see him in person. He was one of those mute fursuiters. They didn't say a single word. They were only mime. Body gestures. One of those who never used their voice. His performance was excellent. He was one of those who got completely into their characters. Also, he was very nice with other fursuiters, in general, to all the people. He really liked interacting with others. He always made innocent jokes that made everyone jiggle. People wanted to take pictures with him. They recorded videos of him and anything they recorded turned out to be very funny. Pretty nice pictures and videos very fun to watch. It was almost a guarantee that if you take a video of that first video, it was going to be something that was going to feed your social network with many likes, lots of retweets, many people were going to share your post. It was more than a guarantee. He was turning very well known in the community. But there was a problem. No one knew his name. Not even what his character was called. What was the name of the fox? What was his character's name? The little fox that this person was performing? No one knew. And every time someone came up to him and asked, Hey, what's your name? He just shrugged. And... No! Phone! Don't ring now! I hope it was not something important. <laughs> What I was saying, no one knew his name, okay? No one knew the name of the Red Fox. They didn't even know the name of the character he performed. And every time someone came up to him and asked him what his name was, he just did like this. He shrugged and kept on acting. Which is not strange because when someone gets into their character a lot, and they are a mute character, they never stop being their character, they never leave their role. He also never wore a badge. Unlike the vast majority of furry fandom members, who always carry a small badge with our name, with a drawing of our character so people can identify us and know what our name is, 
No, he didn't do this. He never wore a badge. And people had that need to call him by a name. On the internet, they started calling him in different ways, always loving names. Because he was gaining the love of the members of the community. They called him the cute little fox, the green ice fox. But thanks to a video where he was popping some bubbles with his nose, video that was very famous, very viral, people named him as Bubbles. Bubbles Fox. People were already identifying him with this name. Even at convention they already called him by this name every time they saw him. And even him knew he was being called like this. Hey, Bubbles! Bubbles! And he turned around, he knew that somebody was going to ask him for a hug or a picture. He always accepted, he never rejected any of these requests. But what reminded a mystery was his identity. No one had ever seen him without a fursuit. He never entered the fursuit lounge. He never took his head off. They didn't even know his gender. They didn't know if it was a boy, a girl, or what. Many people thought he was a boy because of his complexion. Also, others said that maybe she was a girl due to her height. Others preferred to say that they were androgynous. And many others say that it didn't matter that much, that their gender shouldn't matter. People also noticed that he was always wandering alone. He never had a handler, a helper to take care of him. A friend who was making him company on his first walks. Even so, if someone come and ask him if they could be accompanying him, he never said no. He always nodded and let them accompany them. But he seemed never to tire. When others were exhausted from so many hours being partying, he kept going and on and on. And he never accompanied anyone to the first lounge. No one knew who were friends of Bubbles, or even if someone knew him. Nor, nor did anyone ever find that he had any account of Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, for Affinity, or at least an email, nothing. On the internet there were only videos and photos of him from other people who uploaded them. And since they never had anyone to tag, people had created a hashtag, hashtag BubbleFox. Of course, people started having their theories. What people mainly believe is that he was a secret character from somebody else. But rumors were also saying he was actually someone famous. Someone famous who had decided to enter the fandom, but he couldn't reveal his identity underneath the fursuit. For his own privacy, because of course, ain't no celebrity wanting to cause a scandal in their career. But every time people were asking him questions, even when these questions were serious, he was still acting like his character, he didn't respond with any voice, he always kept his performance. Still, the majority in the furry fandom were very fond of him, most of them spoke good things about Bubbles Fox, and it was an example of how positive the community could be in the fandom, how someone could paint so many smiles. But of course, as is natural in this society, not everyone was happy with Bubbles Fox. There are always those haters who, for no apparent reason, and only out of envy, they hated him. They were angry. They couldn't believe how many people cared for that first reader. They said it was very creepy that people have an appreciation for a character without knowing who was under the suit. So many things were said, and big and meaningless discussions were generated on the internet. Where some attacked him and others, the vast majority, defended him. Once, at a convention, something particularly special happened. A group of boys who hated him they had the plan to finally reveal the identity of that fox. They saw him wandering around the convention, 
hopping happily, greeting people, taking pictures with others, and they waited and waited for him to be alone. They were waiting until people stopped hugging him. And the moment they saw him alone, they surrounded him. Obviously, they had no good intentions. And it's something that Bowles noticed. First, he greeted them in a nice cartoonish way as usual. But realizing the intention of this group of guys, he turned serious. He got defensive. But they were more. They started to make stupid pranks to him. They were trying to grab him and trying to take his head off his fursuit. And even when they were too many, well, too many, I'm talking about four of them, Bubbles resisted. He was kicking. They couldn't take his head off. It didn't take many seconds before someone at the convention realized what was happening. This was a girl, a girl named Betty Bieber. She could see what was happening. And she yelled at them, Hey, what do you think you are doing? Leave him alone! Because of the scandal, more people started to approach the scene. And sooner, more people were already protesting to the bullies, asking them to leave that fox for sweeter alone. Some even took their phones and, as usual, took a video of the situation. For all the pressure over them, the bullies ended up releasing Bubbles, knocking him to the ground and they left the scene, while they still receiving insults from people. How do you dare? This is not a correct attitude! Betty, the girl who saw the scene at first, wanted to go help Bubbles up. But before she was getting closer to him, Bubbles got up and ran. She was convinced that what had happened was not fair. That Bubbles now was feeling so sad about what had happened. That's why she wanted to follow him, to comfort him, to encourage him. She wanted to tell him that he shouldn't take that kind of thing so emotionally. That he had to ignore this kind of people. That the fandom usually is kind and nice. She really wanted to make him feel good. But as much as she followed him to tell him all that, she couldn't get him. Bubbles was walking very fast. She was not even getting closer, so she yelled at him, Hey, Bubbles! Bubbles! But the fox didn't stop. Bubbles got behind a door. A door that had a sign of no trespassing. Only hotel staff. She ignored this obvious signal. Betty walked through the door where the fox had just entered. It was a long, dark hallway, barely lit by a series of long, tungsten light bulbs. And the fox was gone. He had simply disappeared. The only thing in the hallway, in the whole long hallway, it was a very large container, one of those containers where hotels keep all the dirty towels. Would he have gotten in there? There was nowhere else he could have gone, the hallway had no doors on either side, and he couldn't have crossed all that hallway in so few seconds. So she opened the lid of the container, and what she found, it was the beginning of what would completely mark her for life. Indeed, Bubbles was in there, but only the suit, there was nobody else. There was no person wearing it. The rest of the container was completely empty. There was only the fur suit without the owner. The full suit, the paws, the head, the body. Bubbles? Where are you? She asked to the air. He couldn't have been so quick to take off his suit and run away from the place. Everything was very strange. 
and suddenly the door opens behind her. Was someone from the hotel staff. He looked at her and said, Hey, you can be here, get out right now! So Betty took the suit and as fast as she could, she took the fox head and quickly wrapped it inside the body of the fursuit. She knew that if people saw her walking around the hotel with Bubbles head, there would be many questions, or they would even think that she is Bubbles. While she was putting the head inside the suit, as fast as possible, she noticed a very strange symbol in the inner back of the fursuit. But there was no time and she quickly finished wrapping the suit and left the place, apologizing to the hotel staff that I'm sorry, it was not my intention to enter here, and she left. She strode, almost running, to the convention lost and found room. Where there was only one volunteer behind the desk. It was a very small and empty room. In there was only this furry volunteer, named Gator. Betty told him, you won't believe me, but I found the Bubbles fox suit in a container. It looked like Bubbles took it off and disappeared. Without letting her continue the her story, Gator, the volunteer in charge of Lost and Found, interrupted her, surprised. Bubbles fox? Without their suit? Did you see how they were like? No, that's, that's the weirdest thing. I didn't see what Bubbles was like. And while Betty told Gator everything that had happened and taking advantage of the fact that there was more light in the place and there wasn't as much trash as a few moments ago, she took a closer look at that symbol on the inside of the suit's back. Both of them observed that symbol in silence. It was a pyramid and in front of the pyramid it was like a monster with several heads and dragon wings. What is this? Is this the mark of the fursuit maker perhaps? I don't think so, Gator said. This is very familiar to me. I've seen it before but I can't remember where. Gator then took out his phone and took a picture of the symbol. Gator folded the bubble suit, hiding the head inside the body once again. And he said, I think it's not correct for many people to know that we have the bubble fur suit on Lost and Found. Only he has to come to claim it. He also explained to Betty how lucky he was feeling. That maybe he was the one who was going to know the true face of Bubbles when he went to claim his fursuit there. Bubbles was also a fursuit that Gator admired a lot, a long time ago that he had admired him, and he agreed completely to respect Bubbles' privacy. Both continued talking for several minutes, getting to know each other. They even shared their telegram, and before saying goodbye, Gator told her that he would let her know what the symbol means, that he was going to be researching. So the hours passed, it got dark, it was already 3 in the morning, night dances were already finishing, some people were still hanging around the convention, and the group of guys who had bullied Bubbles that afternoon, they returned to their room. All of them in definitely no sobriety. They kept talking bad things about Bubbles and how people got so sensitive about someone who was just a character. And then they were already in their room. They were still talking about what had happened in that afternoon, when suddenly they knocked on the door of the room. Everyone remained silent. You go open. No, you. None of them wanted to open, until one of them decided to stand up and open the door. All thought, instead of opening, he looked through the peephole. No, it's nobody, and he returned with his friends while they continued talking. But then... Somebody was knocking the door again, but even louder. The same one who had got up to open, got up again, angrily. And... He opened the door at once. Meanwhile, Betty Bieber, in her room, 
he received a message on her phone. It was from Gator. He just said, the symbol of the bubble suit is about Nomad. She didn't understand. What are you talking about? What is Nomad? Is it a word? Is it a name? Is that how the first suit is called? And without saying anything, Gator sent her a link. Betty opened the link. And she could see it in the header image was the same symbol that they had seen inside the bubble suit. And in the web page, it explained that this symbol belonged to a demon named Nomad. The article described Nomad as a demon who visits our world every 3000 years. He uses disguises to be able to camouflage himself among people, making silent tests to check if humanity has changed, or if we are still the same selfish beings. He always comes back hoping that humans already live in harmony and as a great community but killing anyone who disappoints him by showing them his true identity, his true face. Mary, as soon as she finished reading the article, could hear, as well as everyone who was staying at the hotel, the emergency alarm, the evacuation alarm from the place. Meek, meek, meek. The whole place had to be evacuated at that late night. When everybody was already out of their rooms on the cold street, they could see many patrols and cops entering the place, because they had found that in one of the hotel rooms, a massacre had happened. Her breaking screams had been heard in the room where those guys who had bullied bubbles in the afternoon. None of them had survived. Security cameras were investigating. The cameras had not captured anything. They just showed that everything had happened just when the boys had opened the door in that room. But the camera didn't capture anyone from the other side, just them opening the door. Forensic search for fingerprints in that room? No suspect was known could not be classified as homicide. It was a case that could never be solved. Sadly, that convention, at that time, had to be abruptly cancelled. Which was sad for all the attendees. And before everyone had to leave the premises, Gator returned to the lost and found room, and realized that the bubble suite was no longer there. He asked his staff colleagues about a fursuit that they had left there, that if somebody had not taken it. He didn't specify who the fursuit belonged to, just generalized a fox fursuit, that somebody had brought a night before. And indeed, no one had even known that there was a fursuit placed on the lost objects. Neither Betty nor Gator had mentioned anything they had found. They never even mentioned the symbol of the inside of the back of the bubble suit to anyone. Time passed, and Bubbles kept showing up at other conventions. He never stopped having the positive and charismatic attitude with which everyone knew him. Neither Betty nor Gator ever said anything to the fandom. The only thing they always recommended to their friends? Be nice to Bubbles. You have to give him a good impression of how united we can be as a community, at least most of us. This book is titled The Three Little Wolves and the Big Bad Pig. You can see how cute are the three little wolves. But the big bad pig. He is really big and really bad. If you ever fear the big bad wolf, no, 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 no. The big bad pig has his own issues. Once upon a time, 
there were three cuddly little wolves with soft fur and fluffy tails who lived with their mother. The first was black, the second was grey, and the third was white. One day, the mother called the three little wolves around her and said, My children, it is time for you to go out into the world. Go and build a house for yourselves. But bear of the big bad pig. Don't worry, mother, we will watch out for him, said the three little wolves and they set off. Let me show you how are the three little wolves and their mom. They are cute, aren't they? Soon they met a kangaroo. Who was pushing a wheelbarrow full of red and yellow bricks. Please, will you give us some of your bricks? Asked the three little wolves. Oh no, for free? Nothing. Now but the roo said, certainly. And she gave them lots of red and yellow bricks. So the three little wolves built themselves a house of bricks. Hey, they are wiser than the three little pigs. Do you remember? The pigs started building a house of straws, then one of sticks, and in the end, one of bricks. The three little wolves are smarter. They started making it of bricks. The very next day, the big bad pig came prowling down the road and saw the house of bricks that the little wolves had built. The three little wolves were playing croquet in the garden. They seemed to be very English wolves. When they saw the big bad pig coming, they ran inside the house and locked the door. I want to show you how is the big bad pig. Because he is really scary. Oh man, he is scary. There are the little wolves playing croquet and there is the big bad pig. Ah! The pig knocked on the door and grunted. Little wolves, little wolves, let me come in. No, 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 say the three little wolves. By the hair on our chinny chinny chins, we will not let you in. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down, say the pig. So he huffed and he puffed and he puffed and he huffed, but the house didn't fall down. So you can see how he's huffing and puffing, but the house was not falling down for more tries he was doing. But the pig wasn't called big and bad for nothing. He went and fetched his sledgehammer and he knocked the house down. Just look at this. He's not joking like the big bad wolf saying, hey, let's keep blowing and huffing. No, he was going directly to the point. The three little wolves just managed to escape before the bricks crumbled. And they were very frightened indeed. We shall have to build a stronger house, they said. Just then, they saw a beaver who was mixing concrete in a concrete mixer. Hey, animals are very modern here, eh? Please, will you give us some of your concrete? Asked the three little wolves. Oh wow, these animals are very generous in this story, eh? And with wolves, they are not discriminating like, oh no, they are wolves, let's run. Nope, they don't. Certainly, said the beaver. And he gave them buckets and buckets full of messy, slurry concrete. So the three little wolves built themselves a house of concrete. You can see here the beaver and the wolves building their house with concrete. But guess who is coming next? And he won't be like, let me just blow one half. No, no, no. No sooner had they finished that the big bad pig came prowling down the road and saw the house of concrete that the little wolves had built. They were playing Battledore and Shuttlecock in the garden. I'm telling you, these wolves are very fancy. And when they saw the big bad pig coming, they ran inside their house and shut the door. The pig rang the bell. Oh, good manners by the pig. And said, Little frightened wolves, let me come in. No, 
no, no, say the three little wolves. By the hair on our chinny chinny chins, we will not let you in. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down, say the pig. So he huffs and he puffs and he puffs and he huffs, but the house didn't fall down. Look, I'm gonna show you how is the house. It is not pretty. The house is completely made of concrete and it doesn't have a garden. It is an ugly modern house, no color. Not even minimalist. But the pig wasn't called big and bad for nothing. He went and fetched his pneumatic drill and smashed the house down. The three little wolves managed to escape, but their chinny chinny chins were trembling and trembling and trembling. Look at this, how bad is the big bad pig? Oh no, if he comes to your house, if you see him coming, just run, don't ask, he won't be joking. We shall build an even stronger house, they say, because they were very determined. Just then, they saw a truck coming along the road carrying barbed wire, iron bars, armor plates, and a heavy metal padlocks. Please, will you give us some of your barbed wire, a few iron bars and armor plates, and some heavy metal padlocks? They say to the rhinoceros who was driving the truck. Sure, say the rhinoceros, and he gave them plenty of barbed wire, iron bars, armor plates and heavy metal padlocks. He also gave them some plexiglass and some reinforced steel chains, because he was a generous and kind-hearted rhinoceros. So the three little wolves built themselves an extremely strong house. It was the strongest, securest house one could possibly imagine. They felt absolutely safe. But guess who is coming, and he won't care the hard work of the little wolves. Oh, I didn't show you the house, it is important. It is very important to show you how is the house. Here is the rhinoceros. And the house. It is an ugly house, but they will feel safe here. The next day, the big bad pig came, prowling along the road as usual. The three little wolves were playing hopscotch in the garden. I tell you, they are very fancy little bears. Bears? Bears? Wolves! Little wolves! When they saw the big bad pig coming, they ran inside their house, bolted the door and locked all the 37 padlocks. The pig dialed the video entrance phones and said, Little frightening wolves with the trembling chins, let me come in. No, 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 said the little wolves, by the hair on our chinny chinny chins, we will not let you in. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. So he huffed and he puffed and he puffed and he huffed, but the house didn't fall down. But the pig wasn't called big and bad for nothing. Here is when the scary part starts. He brought some dynamite, laid it against the house. Lead the fuse. Boom! The house blew up! Good things the three little wolves just managed to escape! They were terrified! With their fluffy tails scorched, oh no! Look what happened to their poor tails! Here are the three little wolves running away. Now what can happen? How these three little wolves will be safe from this big bad pig? Something must be wrong with our building materials, they said. We have to try something different. But what? At the moment, they saw a flaming coming along pushing wheelbarrow full of flowers. Please, will you give us some flowers? asked the little wolves. With pleasure, said the flamingo. And he gave them lots of flowers. So the three little wolves built themselves a house of flowers. Now their house is pretty. 
but guess who is coming and he won't be happy for this. One wall was of marigolds, one of daffodils, one of pink roses, one of cherry blossoms. The ceiling was made of sunflowers, and the floor was a carpet of daisies. They had water lilies in their bathtub and buttercups in their refrigerator. It was rather a fragile house and it swayed in the wind, but it was very beautiful. Next day, the big bad pig came prowling down the road and saw the house of flowers that the three little wolves had built. He rang the blue bell at the door and said, Little frightened wolves with the trembling chins and the scorched tails, let me come in. No, 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 said the three little wolves, by the hair of our chinny chinny chins, we will not let you in. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Here you can see how is the bathtub, and the little wolves, poor them, they are so afraid. But as he took a deep breath, ready to huff and puff, he smelled the soft scent of the flowers. It was fantastic, and because the scent was so lovely, the pig took another breath and then another. Instead of huffing and puffing, he began to sniff. He sniffed deeper and deeper until he was quite filled with the fragrant scent. His hair grew tender, and, re and he realized how horrible he had been. Right then, he decided to become a big, good pig. He started to sing and to dance the tarantella. Thanks to the flowers, they turned the pig gay. At first, the three little wolves were a bit worried it might be a trick. But soon, they realized that the pig had truly changed. So they came running out the house, they started playing games with him. First, they played the pig pug, and then piggy in the middle. And when they were all tired, they invited him to the house, finally! Then we see in the last illustration how they came good friends, the little thrill wolves and the big good pig. Okay, the end. This was not a spooky story, but I really hope you like it. This is one of my favorite stories and I wanted to tell it to you. And I think time is over. I really hope you had liked my three stories. So, I can call them horror stories. It was a sad story, an urban legend, and a story where we know how a big bad pig turned gay and friend of three little wolves. Oh, I should give the respective credits to the author of the book. What's wrong with me? I had already thrown it over there. The author of the book is Eugene Trevisas and Helen Oxenbury. Helen Oxenbury is the illustrator, and Eugene Trevisas is the writer. In case you want to get the book, because it is very cute. Bye! I can keep waving this until they cut me. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha